Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to Day 271 of Humanity Rising. As we gather today, uh, the world is in tumult. Uh, over the weekend, uh, the G7 meeting uh, in England uh, designated China as uh, the new enemy uh, and the consternation around that uh, pronouncement uh, has uh, reverberated around the world. Uh, today on the news uh, uh, here in the United States, um, it was reported that there's a heat wave uh, sweeping uh, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, Utah, uh, that is going to break, they say, 200 heat records uh, and plunge um, uh, this part of the North American continent into unprecedented heat, all due to uh, runaway uh, climate change. And so as we look around the world, wherever we are, uh, it's clear uh, that we need a new story. We need a new way of understanding diversity within the human community. Uh, we need a new story to fathom uh, uh, a new relationship with the larger planetary ecology. Uh, and uh, one of the great contributions of the pandemic that we're going through is it broke up the certainties we had about a story that was uh, essentially completely dysfunctional and has led uh, the human race to the brink, the very brink of self-destruction. So today we're gonna contemplate story and um, uh, what uh, story uh, would be like if it was told by uh, people other than men, uh, which we'll develop in a few minutes. But let us begin as we always do, just take a moment and center yourself in your body. Attune yourself uh, to your heart just for the next minute or two. Attune yourself to your heart in a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving that you're alive. We're all alive at this most extraordinary moment in the human journey. Thank you, everyone. Now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you uh, who are joining our session today, uh, I want to introduce uh, to all of you uh, a woman who has written a number of best-selling books, who's had a life of activism, and whose latest book, Cassandra Speaks, is about how our stories change when women, rather than men, uh, tell the story. Uh, Elizabeth Lesser, 
Uh, Elizabeth uh, was the co-founder of Omega Institute uh, back in the 1970s. I think it was founded in 1977, uh, following in the footsteps of Esalen Institute uh, that was founded by Michael Murphy and Dick Price uh, in the 1950s. And uh, uh, with Esalen, Omega Institute and a number of other uh, retreat centers that sprang up uh, afterward uh, really shaped uh, the human potential movement, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. Most of the cultural changes uh, that we are witnessing around the world uh, were given their initial impulse and shape uh, by light centers like Esalen, uh, uh, like Omega, like Fintorn, uh, like Kripalo, like the Open Center of New York. And Elizabeth uh, was uh, uh, one of the founders of what became uh, actually the largest uh, retreat center uh, uh, in America. Uh, she wrote a number of books. Uh, she wrote a book called The Seeker's Guide, which were lessons that she learned uh, out of her experience in co-founding Omega Institute. Um, she wrote another book, which was a bestseller, New York Times bestseller called Broken Open, um, about how you know, when we get wounded, how breakdown can become breakthrough uh, if the consciousness and the intentionality is, is properly, al properly aligned uh, with the wound itself. Uh, and then most recently, uh, Cassandra Speaks, uh, which is really uh, at a time of the pandemic, uh, uh, offering an alternative view and a new view about how humanity needs to narrate uh, simply a new mythology, a new uh, story uh, spoken by women. So uh, Elizabeth, uh, welcome to Humanity Rising. Uh, and um, why don't we just begin for you, with you just telling us a little bit about uh, your origins and you know, what led you, for example, to uh, co-found the Omega Institute? And obviously would love to explore a uh, little bit of what you learned uh, in the founding and guiding uh, uh, Omega now uh, over uh, 50 years. But welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here. And uh, I just wanna return the favor of your beautiful introduction and saying you two have been at the forefront of this movement, shall we call it. And I've always had so much respect for you and your work and, and consider you a, a fellow traveler on this journey. So thank you so much for having me. It's just a pleasure to be here and hello to everyone who's here today. And thank you for being with me. So how did I come to co-found Omega Institute? Um, you know, sometimes when people come to Omega and it's this huge campus and there are, you know, always five, 600 people there at one time and 30,000 people pass through our doors. Now this was pre-pandemic, we've been closed for a year and a half, but um, people say, how did you found this when you were like 22 years old? Well, that isn't what I co-founded. I co-founded a tiny little idea that started as a bunch of kids with an idea. And the reason I was drawn to transformational work, let's call it, psycho psychotherapy, spirituality, meditation, yoga, good food, all things that were seen as like really weird and on the fringes back in the late 1970s and 80s um, was because I was raised in an opposite kind of home. I was raised by intellectual political parents who thought religion was like the, the equation in my family was, is if you had any spiritual leanings, you were unintelligent. Like you couldn't be intelligent and a seeker. Those two things were opposites. And so I was raised to be this, you know, intellectually striving, educated human. But I was one of those weird little kids even within my family, there were four kids in our family. I was the weirdo because I had a spiritual longing. I would like go with my next door neighbors to Catholic mass. 
and my parents and sisters would fall on the ground laughing. They thought I was just so strange. My big dream in life was to be a nun. And I don't know where that came from, you know, if you believe in past lives um, or some sort of DNA following you, because I've gone back into the DNA in my family and there were super spiritual people in my family line. Anyway, I followed that yearning. I never squashed that yearning, thank goodness. And by the time I got to college, it was the height of, of the anti-war and civil rights. And I was so involved in them because that's what my parents thought good people did. Thank God, I love that part of myself. But more than anything, I wanted a spiritual teacher. And fortunately, in those times, uh, gurus were like washing up on the shores of America. And I thought, I want one of them. That's what I want. That is what I want, a teacher who might explain some of the big questions that my parents always laughed at, like, who am I? What's my calling? Where do I go when I die? Where did I come from? How do we live a moral life together as humans? I wanted to explore that. And so I did find a teacher, a brilliant, wonderful man in the Sufi tradition, Pir Vilayat Khan, who was very interested in all religious traditions. The, um, the similar strain that was in all of them. And he, it was like going to college being his student because he taught us about all the different wisdom traditions, psycho psychology, healing, strength. And um, it was he who had the idea to start Omega Institute. And he put myself and my ex-husband who is a medical doctor in charge of Omega. And I had the role of what should this curriculum be? What should this holistic, it was, <laughs> he came up with the word Omega Institute for holistic studies, holism being treating the human being as a whole person, body, mind, spirit, social interaction, relationship. And I just started combing the world for interesting people who might contribute to the ongoing education of, of the human spirit. And that's how it came to be. That's how Omega came to be. Fabulous, fabulous. I remember Pierre Vallayat. I met him once or twice. And uh, what an elegant, elegant spirit. Uh, elegant just... spirit. You know, the thing about him is that he was raised by an Indian guru, a Sufi guru, a Muslim Indian guru, Hazrat Inayat Khan, who left India to bring the Sufi tradition, which is the mystical dimension of Islam, to the West. And he met Thirvalayat's mother in the United States, who was a niece of the founder of Christian science. Mm -hmm. So he sort of married into the mystical tradition that was going on in the 1920s in the United States, that great awakening of theosophy and things like that. So when Pir Vilayat was born, he was born into these two traditions. He was educated at Oxford. He fought in World War II for the Allies and he was raised mostly in Paris. So he was a very elegant man. And when he came to the US and all these hippie kids, myself included, um, were like wearing all this wacky stuff and lying down during meditations and doing drugs. And he was like, no, you sit up, you have a strong backbone, no drugs, real devotion to awakening. Um, and so by the time I was, I met him when I was 19, suddenly I was like on this very disciplined spiritual path. And he brought that to the founding of Omega, like real rigor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, your first book, The Seeker's Guide, uh, is of real interest to me and I think to our community about uh, what you learned uh, in the process of, of establishing Omega. Uh, and I think that's important because whether it's Humanity Rising or Omega Today or Esalend or Kripalo and uh, all the, the retreat centers and light communities around the world, um, you know, we always feel that 
somehow were marginalized uh, in, in terms of the mainstream of history and society. Uh, and we have challenge after challenge in growing ourselves, expanding into uh, uh, something that can actually make a difference. So I would be very interested in, in if you were gonna be writing the seeker's guide today and looking at you know, 50 years of uh, transformational holistic learning, uh, Elizabeth, um, what, what, what have you learned? What, what, what experiences, what wisdom would you share uh, for any of us you know, seeking uh, the pathway of transformation, but in particular, the pathway of transformation that is trying to change society mm. at such a critical moment of uh, existential danger? It's so, it's so funny you should ask me this because the past two weeks, my husband and I have been cleaning out our basement. <laughs> uh, we had a flood in the basement and boxes and boxes and boxes of books and papers from our children's drawings to our college books like got ruined. And we had to bring them up and see, could we save anything? And then most everything went to the dump which is good, by the way, I recommend that because most everything you don't need to save anyway. But I came across a box of some of the early teaching I did because I was never a born teacher. I liked being the wind beneath the sails of other teachers at Omega for years and years. And when I stepped out after my first book, The Seeker's Guide to Teach, it, it wasn't really my natural habitat. But there was all of this records of what my early workshops were. And I took out one sheet, which was called The Best and the Worst of the New Age. And it was from The Seeker's Guide, which by now is a 25-year-old book. I forget how long ago I wrote it, 20 years ago. And I was shocked at how relevant that piece of paper still is. The best of the transformational movement that I was deep in and the worst. And I think what I, what to me is evergreen about that book, The Seeker's Guide, is that it's not only helpful to look at what we're all doing as the world knows, needs what we know. We know they don't, we're the best, they're not, they need to think the way we do. Um, I've always been aware that, that any movement has its shadow. And I think it's really important, especially those of us who are leaders and who deeply believe in that, that human beings are not living up to our potential and we can, and it's possible. And there are technologies for doing it. Those of us who believe that, we also need to look at sort of the shadowy sides. And one of them is this sense that we're really different from other people. And this is the worst time in human history. And we have what they need and they don't have it. And how do we get it? Um, I think all leaders need to look within at, at really bolstering our humility and a vast consciousness, a patient consciousness that knows we're gonna do the best we can with lots of love and a sense of connection, even to people who don't believe the way we do. And we're going to do it with devotion and rigor, but also with, you know, I was, as you were leading the heart meditation when we started and those women were chanting, I was brought back to the time when early Christianity, when women did a lot of chanting and it was the time of that great uh, Christian mystic uh, Dame Julian of Norwich. And she has this line that I always say to myself when I get freaked out, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And that isn't like a anesthesia, like don't care, but it, it tells me like, there have been terrible times in history all the time. And there have been light bearers throughout history. And we're in that tradition and we can't lose faith. But on the other hand, we can't rush it 
or feel despair if it's not happening. Like it will happen, maybe not in our lifetime, maybe in our lifetime. I'm gonna act as if it is happening in our lifetime, but maybe it won't, but we don't know what's going on here. Another great teacher who used to come to Omega all the time. Um, oh gosh, uh, Terrence McKenna. Remember Terrence McKenna? He was a psychedelic researcher slash experiencer, <laughs> but brilliant, brilliant, deeply educated mythological thinker. And he would always say, um, fear and depression are hubris. How do you know what's going on? How do you know what should be happening? So whenever I feel myself despairing for the world and terrified and absolutely convinced that I know what should happen and I have the goods, I, try, I listen to both Dame Julian of Norwich from the 12th century and Terence McKenna who died in the 1980s saying, yes, I know what's good for me and for the world. And no, I don't fully understand how this should happen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna always flood my work with love and faith. That did not answer your question. I even forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it did actually. And um, uh, I, I, uh, I want to uh, go deeper into this um, light and shadow dimension of, of uh, you know, the so-called new age or human uh, potential uh, uh, movement. Um, uh, because I, I think this notion that you're raising of, of certainty uh, is, um, in, in my mind, is ambiguous in a certain way. Uh, one thinks of Martin Luther King, one thinks of Gandhi, one thinks of Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu in South Africa. Uh, in order to, 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 to transact change, it's also necessary to go into the complexity with enough confidence and certainty that there are certain, I would say, cosmic truths that that are just true and that um you know as martin luther king said you don't really begin to live unless you're willing to die for something so I, I i would love to have you comment on this um because i think it's uh uh, uh something you're right that there can be false certainties um and and overconfidence but on the other hand, there's also the need for uh, uh, the kind of certitude that empowers people to make changes in the face of, of deep uh, uncertainty. Does yeah. that make sense? Totally. And, you know, the answer is yes to both of us, of course. And, and I know there are probably times you take the tact I was taking and I take the tack you want. So like, <laughs> it's the marriage of certitude, fortitude, will, with patience, equanimity, and love. You know, that, that's it. You know, Dr. King also said that that arc is, is bending toward justice, but we don't know when it's going to get there. Um, so uh, you mentioned China. And, and, uh, and President Biden and the European Union suddenly making China enemy number one and how that's the old story. And so my question always is if the new story is no enemy, just us struggling humans trying to live together on this beautiful, perfect planet made perfectly for us, for our lungs to breathe the air, for our body to use the water, for, for pleasure and loveliness. And then we're just screwing it up every day and turning everyone else into the other, otherizing everyone. My question always comes back to, besides my social activism work that I do, how am I doing inside here? 
Am I making people others all the time? And the only, the, all I was talking about was that this surety that this little group of us called transformational folks have it and no one else does. I, I'm not saying you were saying that, but like if I were to talk about my greatest ideals and my morals to a um, evangelical Christian who voted for Trump, I bet we would have the exact same deep, deep beyond the layers of should there be abortion? Is climate change real? You know, deeper, deeper, deeper. What do you yearn for in your family and your community? I venture to say we have the same core dreams and desires. I'm interested to how to know how to meet someone there and not like you're wrong and I'm right. I mean, I've spent years and years creating conferences around this. I gave a TED talk several years ago called Take the Other to Lunch, which was this faux um, program I had started where you, you take someone who you disagree with to lunch and just get to know each other as if that could heal the world. And it was sort of tongue in cheek knowing that it's way more complicated than that, but it's also not way more complicated than that. Um, my work is both to see in the other their best and to stop otherizing them and thinking that my little slice of humanity has what everyone else needs. Because you see what happens. There's a bad track, track record for that kind of thinking, whether it's in Rwanda, where people just because they're from like tiny different tribes killed each other or Cambodia or the Nazis, you know, this idea that they're wrong, we're right. Anyway, um, yes, we need to stand like Joan of Arc, knowing what's right, but we need to hold it in a way that doesn't make other people wrong. I think that's beautifully, beautifully put. We need to stand knowing what's right, but we should forego the condemnation that the other person is wrong. I think that's a beautiful way to, to put it, uh, Elizabeth. And it's I, so hard. It's so yeah, hard, Jim. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the hardest thing. I'm not saying I do it that well, but I try. Well, you know, and it's, it's, it's worth just underscoring this point for a moment because we're in a world where social media, you know, on Facebook and, and Google and so forth is structured uh, in terms of the algorithms uh, to reinforce our own prejudices. So we're all ending up with reinforcing information coming at us that we think is somehow truth, but it's just make, putting us in silos that are getting more and more uh, dis, uh, disconnected from each other. And I know uh, one of good friends, I'm sure to both of us, Joan Blades, who was one of the co-founders yes. of MoveOn.org. Yeah, the um, conversation. But, Project, She's got the, yeah. her dinner table conversations and you're taking people out to lunch. Um, and so say a little bit more about what you've learned when you've taken somebody out to lunch. <laughs> well, I've, really, I've learned exactly what you said, or I said, or we both said, that I can stand firm in my beliefs and I can love the other person. I started this thing because um, at Omega for the past 15 or more years, I've convened a conference called Women in Power. And that's out of which my new book, Cassandra Speaks, came from those keynote speeches I would give there. And um, it was this idea I had, um, when you put the words women and power together, it makes everyone uncomfortable, women included. It's just such a strange, women aren't supposed to want or have power. And this was especially true back when I started those conferences. Um, <clears throat> and as we went along in those conferences, I began to notice that the kind of women coming to Omega and to a conference on feminism, obviously, <clears throat> um, all had similar social, political leanings. And I thought, Okay, let's test if women really do power differently. Let's test ourselves. 
let's bring some people in as speakers who don't believe the way we believe. Are, do women do power differently? Will we be more embracing? So I found this amazing group in Boston of women high up in the pro-life movement and women high up in the pro-choice movement. After uh, a doctor had been killed at an abortion clinic, the city went up in flames and these women decided, this isn't what we want. We're pro-life, so to speak. We're pro-choice, so to speak. But we don't want our city to be destroyed over this. Can we come together? And they did it secretly for many years because people on their side of the aisle, so to speak, would have been horrified to hear that they were getting together with someone from the other side. And what happened to them, and they came to Omega and sat on the stage and talked about what had happened to them over these years. They fell in love with each other as human beings. No one changed anyone's mind. The women working for the Archdiocese of Boston against abortion were still firmly against abortion. And the women who were working really hard to protect Roe v. Wade and make sure the abortion clinic stayed open, stayed as strong for it. But they fell in love with each other. They went to each other's kids' confirmations and bar mitzvahs, and they, they went to funerals, and they had dinner at each other's houses, and they became very close friends and remained so for years and years. I found that instructive and moving. Other women in the audience did not at all. They felt you're just legitimizing the enemy. And so I became aware that it's not just women we need to center. It's anyone, man or woman, who's tired of patriarchy. And I use that in a broad sense, which is this idea of pitting people against each other and um, not understanding connectivity relationality as being like the core aspect of our humanity that we have to put forward. I feel women have more connection to that than men, but that doesn't mean some women don't and other men don't. Anyway, what I found in taking the other to lunch, and I did it many, many times, was the capacity of the human being to have a strong opinion and a loving heart because Differences of opinion are never going to go away, ever, ever, ever. Just like diversity of race and gender and trees in the forest are good, so is diversity of opinion. We check and balance in each other. We need each other. So we got to love each other. Yeah, I mean, that is, that's, that's a very important uh, story. Uh, although I, 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 I'm a little sad to hear that none of the women change their minds. That's, that's an interesting phenomenon that you can become socially and emotionally very close, but still intellectually that's um, okay, though. far apart. That's very you interesting. Say, you can no change person. your heart. You don't have to change your mind. You can change your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's... Uh, Let's. Uh, I mean, uh, unless you're like a Nazi or a, a yeah. white supremacist, uh, I I hope those minds get changed, and if they don't, I hope they get locked up. So, but most people, most people aren't white supremacists or Nazis or whatever your pathology du jour is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's uh, uh, deepen this, uh, Elizabeth, uh, around. Um, you know, the, the, the whole question of story, uh, because, you know, whether it's those women on the two sides of the uh, abortion issue, um, all of us are who we are because of the stories that we tell ourselves. And um, uh, so I would love to just sort of now dive into Cassandra uh, Speaks um, and, um, you know, share with us your your, how did you come to this sense of the importance of story and um, the importance now in our time of listening to women's stories? Um, well, I, 
I've always known that, that humans learn by stories. When I wrote The Seeker's Guide, it's a big, long book, and it's full of, of you know, a glossary and, a, and footnotes and delving in back into American traditions of, of awakening over 200 years and the philosophers and the Greeks. And, and it, it's, it's a, it's, I did a lot of research for that book. But when I told my own story in that book, my own losses, my own mistakes, my own misconceptions and how I used the skills that I was being taught. That's when pe people would say to me, oh, I loved your book. Well, I didn't read the whole book. Well, I only skipped ahead to your stories. And uh, when I wrote my next book, Broken Open, it was all stories. And it was mostly about my own wackadoodle life and how I, um, you know, I, there was a phrase I used that many, many, I've gotten thousands of letters about that book. And people always refer to this tiny little chapter in the book called Bozos on the Bus, how we're all bozos on the bus on a pothole ride. And if we could accept that none of us are perfect and all of us are works in progress, stop being so hard on ourselves and each other, we would progress so much faster. And so I decided that story is the way people learn all the way back into the Bible stories. Look at the wisdom tradition books, Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, the Quran, uh, the Buddha stories. They're all stories. They're not like, you know, unreadable philosophy books where you're trying to impress a person how like deep you are. Uh, you're not Foucault in France, you know, using language that no one understands and therefore you, you, you're, oh, he's smart. It's not about that. It's about story. It's about movies. It's about the great novels. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. So um, when you look back in the Bible and the Greek myths, which really are the two Western teaching story traditions, they were all told and written by men. It's not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's leaving out the values and perspectives of more than half of humanity. And so if you look at the early story, let's take our earliest origin story in Western traditions, Adam and Eve. And I go into this in the book. I, I deconstruct several of our origin stories from the Greeks and from the Abrahamic traditions the Bible. Here's the cliff notes of the Adam and Eve story. Everything was just really great in the Garden of Eden. You know, there was God and there was Adam. And there were friendly animals and plenty to eat, no work, no toil, just it was great. And then it went on for a long time. They never say how long. And then God said, Adam needs someone to help him, a helpmate it's called. And I, I sometimes think it's because God got really tired of taking care of Adam. And so he needed someone to help him. And so he made Eve. So Eve was born second, created second, but she was the first to sin. There was no sin in the garden until Eve came along. Now remember, dudes wrote this story, okay? If women had written this story, I don't think it would be the same. Eve was tempted by a snake. In biblical times, snakes actually were the purveyors of wisdom. You see the snake image a lot in pre-biblical times. It was, snakes were wisdom carriers. Uh, so they were like shamans, the underworld coming above, twisting around and telling the truth. Transformational, they were transformational. And, and the snake said to Eve, there's a, a, a tree in the middle of the garden. And if you eat it, you will have the vision of God. And Eve said, no, God said not to eat it or we die. Now, I think what, that's, what that meant was you will die to your illusions and your child self and you will mature. Because the rest of the heroes in the Bible all had to die to their child self. Christ on the cross. Jonah, uh, Job, 
Abraham, they all went through trials and tests and had to leave home to find their truth. Eve is the only biblical character who is punished for that urge to find wisdom. And that sticks to us through the story, even if you don't read the Bible. It sticks to us. Woman was born second. She was an afterthought, but she was the first to sin. There's a character in Greek myths, Pandora, who is the same. She was the first woman. She was given as a punishment to men who were the only humans because um, Prometheus stole the fire. Is that right? And um, she, was a pun she was punished. She was told, don't open the box, which was actually a jar, but don't open it. And she disobeyed because that's the other thing women are portrayed of. They disobey. Who? The men. They disobey because they're curious, bad. In the myths, the curious man, he's the wanderer. He's on the, he's on the hero's journey because he's curious. Women don't go on the hero's journey. They sin. So those stories stick to us. And I did a lot of reading of the old stories as I was writing the book. And that trope just is everywhere that women came second, but they sinned and they must be controlled and punished. Well, we are trying to get out from under that story now and it will serve everyone if we do. How would you rework uh, the Garden of Eden story? If you were telling it uh, as a woman, uh, you know, using a lot of the same motifs and materials what would your story be? How, what, what, would, what would be embedded in, in uh, the early book of Genesis? It would be that God created humans and we were children. We were immature. And the whole point of it was that we need to mature as a species. We are smarter maybe than animals, but we are very emotionally immature, irresponsible, wanting to be taken care of. And the whole point of the individual journey and the collective journey is that we become wise, that we become, we, we know the thoughts of God. As Einstein said, I want to know the thoughts of God, the rest are just details. Like we want to know, how do I show up here as a loving servant of the good? How do I enjoy this place and share its riches with everyone, all species, all beings? So I would say Eve followed that urge and then she invited Adam to, and Adam was, yes, we must grow up. We have to leave God the father and, and become as gods. Otherwise we're just gonna be very immature children and children get into trouble they lie, they cheat, they blame. They, they, we need to grow up. I consider Eve the first grown up in the Bible. And um, then in my version, God would say, bless you children. Go on your journey. It might be hard. You're going to make mistakes and it might take a long time, but I've got your back and you're going to get there. And here are some ways to do it. That's how I would tell it. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, worth contemplating the story of Pandora too. I'd love to hear your rendition for, of, of Pandora. And it's worth just noting uh, everyone that the Greeks so sequestered uh, the women that the women developed their own dialect. Right. Um, uh, because they were they were just sequestered in this horrendously patriarchal society who uh, considered uh, women not only to be lesser, but as Hesiod, uh, who was the poet that wrote the stories that we have about uh, Pandora, uh, not only lesser, but uh, sinister. Uh, and that, uh, the world really would have bad, been dude. better off had they not been there, but men can't procreate, so they're kind of a, a necessary uh, evil 
and uh, whatever they do just kind of opens the box. So take that story for just a, a minute, Elizabeth, and, and, and rework it uh, uh, for us. I mean, women were so sequestered, they weren't allowed to read or write. Mm -hmm. Just like um, early American enslaved people weren't allowed to read or write. It's a powerful way of controlling whole groups of people if they can't share their stories. Because sharing stories creates reality and those realities endure until new stories come in. And new stories always do come in. We are in the midst of rewriting all sorts of stories right now. But Pandora was um, a gift, a punishment gift. The word Pandora means either punishment or gift. And um, she was told, uh, stay in the house. You are, she, she was married. She was sent down as a wife of Prometheus's brother. And you have to stay in the house and not do anything. Just stay there and don't open the jar. But she was curious. So she opened the jar and out from the jar came this hissing noise and terrible smell. This is Hesiod's poem, if you read it. And um, all the evils, including death. People, men didn't die before she came. This is the weird thing. Women bring death in the stories except in real life, women bring life. So that's weird. Um, so anyway, the, a part of the Pandora story that's never told, but Hesiod does tell. Remember everybody, these are stories. There is no Pandora. She is not a real person. She was a God. She, she was not a mortal. So this is a story. She put the cover back on the jar just in time to keep one of the spirits in. And that spirit's name was Elpis, and that means hope. She kept hope in the jar so that humans would have something in their pocket to deal with all the sadness and grief and loss. They had hope. And now some of the old storytellings, they, you know, the stories were told first on, on um, pottery, they were written on pottery. And so some of the shards that they've been finding actually tell different stories than Hesiod's poetry. And one is that she didn't open the jar, that a trickster God opened the jar and she put the top on in time to save hope. Mm -hmm. So I like to always remember that Elpis remained in the jar for us. And that even when things are terrible, we have hope and we have this, this ability to envision a better future. Beautiful, uh, beautifully put, thank you so much. And you know, now uh, Elizabeth's kind of fast forwarding to the, to the present moment. Um, I'd like to just explore your experience um, of the pandemic in relationship to story, because I think one of the extraordinary um, aspects of the pandemic that we're undergoing uh, now 15, 16 months in, uh, remembering that the World Health Organization declared the pandemic, I think it was on the 11th of March in 2020, and now we're significantly beyond that, is that it both brought humanity into the same story in this case, we're all suffering this pandemic. Um, uh, and therefore, the same conversation. But it also, I think, broke humanity's confidence in the stories up to the pandemic. Because I think now all of us are more vulnerable. And as you point out in your book, uh, Broken Open, once you're broken open, um, there's a, almost by definition, there's a breakdown in the, in the pre-existent structures that had brought you to this moment of some trauma or some wound. But it's also an amazing opportunity for transformation and renewal. So I'd love to hear you know, how you've experienced the pandemic, uh, uh, particularly in relationship to this larger 
question that you're addressing through Cassandra Speaks of story. I mean, what story was broken? What stories are now possible as you've experienced, you know, the last 15, 16 months? Oh, wow. That's in, in a way, the answer is embedded in your question. That was a beautiful question. Um, you know, I think everyone watching and listening today knows this concept in their own life that dark things visit us. No one ever promised that life here as humans in this incarnation on this earth is going to be like always soft and sweet and nice. No one ever promised us that. You just have to look at the wildness of nature, forest fires and earthquakes and volcanoes. We live in a very um, volatile place here and we're soft skinned animals and we do die. So life is, is, is never promised as like something that we're gonna get a hold on and make it easy. And we've all had examples clunked in our head over and over, we get sick. Someone we love dies, our child has trouble, we get divorced, our partner has an affair, all, all the things that like remind us over and over, life is difficult as the Buddha said. And the first noble truth is life is difficult, but we spend so much energy fighting against life is difficult. No, it shouldn't be difficult, not my life, I don't want it, no, no. But, but that fight keeps us from relaxing into the mystery of it all and enjoying it and, and asking the dark times, how do I learn? How do I grow? What have you come to teach me? That doesn't make it less grievous, but it gives you an opportunity to, to change because as you said, trauma can either break you down or break you open. And I remember when I was first writing the book and I was sitting in New York City with the marketing team at Random House and they said, what are you gonna call the book? And I said, broken open, because it comes from a roomy poem. He says, dance when you're broken open. And they said, no, you can't call it broken open. That'll scare people. No, you have to call it something like the light at the end of the tunnel or something like that. I was like, no. And I was really glad I held to it because no, that's not the truth. The truth is us humans, for whatever reason, only learn when shit happens. <laughs> that's the way we learn. You know it in your own life. You're going along, aren't I great? Everything's great. And then no, you're not so great. Mm -hmm. So help me become better. Help me grow, help me grow up. And so the pandemic, could be our best friend, even though that is not to make light of the people we have lost and the jobs we have lost and the poverty that has become even worse. All the things we know that the pandemic has washed in, up onto our shores. But with that comes the opportunity to say, are we all one? What happens to one person in China at a food stall suddenly affects the entire global economy and health, humans, can you get it? China's not the enemy, they're just a bunch of people trying to either break open or break down. Can we be one? Can we be one? This is what the, the shaman named COVID has come to ask us. Can we be one? Now, we only can if we greet it like that. Most people aren't gonna greet it like that. They're gonna be like, when the hell can I get back on a plane? When can my business open? And then forget it and just go on and not understand that climate change and poverty and everything has to do with the same thing, our, our, our lack of oneness. But I think the more global these traumas are, whether it's climate change or a pandemic, the more we're gonna wake up. It's somewhat of a race. Does the wakefulness win? Or does the sleepy ignorance win? What wins this race? I don't know, but I'm gonna do everything I can to, you know, love on the human race and 
try to be an agent of wakefulness. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, let's let's dwell for a moment on uh, the meta theme of your your book uh, about women. Um, that when women tell the stories, you know, history changes, the stories change. Um, say more about that in light of the the women's movement, uh, because in the last seventy five years, you know, women have burst into the world stage and engaged in a transformation, which has involved the acquisition of power uh, yeah. in, in very uh, uh, clear ways. We have the vice president uh, of the United States as a woman, leaders all over the world uh, are now uh, women. Um, so speak to us, Elizabeth, about, you know, how do women tell different stories? What is it about women that would cause them to tell uh, fundamentally different stories about humanity and history and culture and spirituality than men? Well, first of all, let, let me just say, not all women, not all men, not all women good, all men bad. That is just so not what I believe or I'm saying. And there's really paltry language for this, but just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to say the feminine principle that, that wants to connect and communicate. Um, that's what I'm talking about. But the word feminine is so like clunky and not exactly it. But here's a, here's a science story that we all believe that, that will lead to answering your question. So in the 19... 30s and 40s, a scientist named Walter Cannon at Harvard decided he was going to bring people into his laboratory and uh, recreate traumatic events and then um, in the lab and then measure the, the people in the lab, their hormones and blood to see what is elicited in humans physiologically that that creates the stress syndrome in their minds, what, what, what happens in the human body mind under stress? And he was the one who came up with the phrase, um, uh, fight or flight. Under stress, human beings either aggress or they flee. And not just physically flee, they detach. Mm -hmm. they, they isolate. So they either aggress or isolate. He did this study over and over until it became part of our vernacular. What do you do under stress? Fight or flight. That's it's natural. It's war or it's it's running away. So in the in 2007, a woman at UCLA, a doctor, uh, um, Dr. Shelley Taylor, she and her colleagues noticed something. Every one of those studies were done on men. Only men were brought into the lab because up until very recently, only men were brought into the lab for everything, all sorts of heart disease and cancer. Women weren't used because it was unladylike to do experiments on women. Everything suffered for that for women, health things. But this story that only fight or flight is what happens, she totally disproved this by bringing women into the lab and measuring their hormones and blood chemistry under the same simulated stressful situations. And she wrote an amazing book, The Tending Instinct. And she came up with the phrase, tend and befriend. The hormones and blood chemicals that were released under stressful situations for women, and she also studied mammals, female mammals, makes them want to tend the most vulnerable. So a stressful thing happens, a war, a pandemic, women want to care for the most vulnerable, the children, the older people. There is an actual um, tending instinct that women have. And then also under stress, women befriend, which means, you know, you come home from work from a really shitty day. And what do you do? You don't just drink a beer and watch TV. You call your friends. And you're like, you wouldn't believe what happened. What do you think I should do? What should I say? And these circles of friendship 
and support happened. Mm. And everybody knows that, that life is better when you have a community of support. So this isn't to say that all women only tend and befriend under stress. There's lots of aggression and anger and everything like that. But an entire repertoire of what is available to human beings under stress, tending and befriending, has been left out of the science story and has no value attributed to it. You know, women who work as nurses, home health care people, child care people, teachers, the jobs that have been relegated to women, and women's a tendency to talk and communicate and befriend have no value in our society. So it's not only that women should be more leaders. It's not enough to me that women, just because there are vaginas in leadership, that everything's going to be good. It's that our values become elevated. So, so, the, so the first responders who go out and and police people and armies and soldiers, we need them sometimes, but I would like to see statues in the park also of teachers and nurses and women delivering babies. And this idea that it is incredibly necessary and valuable to pay those people well, to, to make them heroic. I would like to change what we think of as heroic. And that means then the tend and befriend instinct in humanity actually begins to prevail. Mm. You know, I didn't know about that study. No one does. Th that that is... book is out of print. That book is out of print. That blows my mind, you know, because we all just assume the fight or flight. I didn't know till just now that that was all Correct. going on, man. But it makes perfect sense that 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 would be a male response uh, but and that the female response would be to tend the vulnerable and um uh and show uh, our emotions like i when i read that it changed so much yeah. i'd be in a meeting and i'd notice stressful things were happening between us and guys would get aggressive and i would want to cry and I would think, oh, I'm so weak. What a wimp I am. But actually, I have trained myself now to think, you go, girl, you cry. You show everyone the pain of this, not just the defensiveness and the aggression, the feeling function. Because if we know what each other are feeling, suddenly aggression really, I see what it is. It's fear. It's children being afraid. And, and you soften the field and you open the field for real conversation. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, and just thinking more broadly uh, about the stories we hear from uh, Charles Darwin and others about evolution, uh, the prevailing storyline is that it's the survival of the fittest. Correct. Uh, it's random selection. Uh, and <clears throat> life is uh, brutish, harsh, and short, and you just got to get out there and and uh, greed is good. And uh, one of the people that we've had on Humanity Rising, David Sloan Wilson, who's an evolutionary biologist, uh, like this uh, uh, woman uh, in 2007, is 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 articulating a whole new theory of evolution based on data that. Uh, Darwin uh, didn't have at his disposal that is indicating that actually life is intensely collaborative. Right. And that uh, competition is certainly uh, happens, but it happens within a web of life and a web of collaboration um, that he calls pro-social, that the evolutionary impulse is pro-social. Uh, it's pro-sharing. It's pro and that that is the actual, the most fundamental survival strategy. Um, and, and that's uh, what the tend and befriend <laughs> idea is about. It's not that we would never be aggressive and there would never be a need for a policeman or a soldier. 
but it's that they should be the last thing we need. And that will happen if the pro-social agents, and many, many times they are women. And I really do believe that if women claim power, but do it differently, and don't think that to be powerful, we just have to replicate the way it's always been done, but we learn to trust our instincts, then men, so many men I talk to are like, please, please do that. Please take, here's the torch, take it. I don't want it anymore. Show me how, but do it differently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, 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 Kayla just put in the in the chat that the book was uh, by uh, Shelley Taylor is called The Tending Instinct. Right. And the subtitle is, um, uh, when um, men and the biology of nurturing is the subtitle, but the tending instinct that's so uh, women, it's women and the, not men, women and the biology of nurturing. Thank you. Uh, so that's worth picking up everyone because uh, uh, that's a big news that has not made it in the <laughs> mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> news alert <laughs> <laughs> so as you um, um, look at the present world situation I mean one of the uh, not tragedies may not be the right word but one thinks of a Hillary Clinton uh, in the 2016 presidential election and her career one thinks of uh, Maggie Thatcher in Britain uh, decades earlier Indira Gandhi, you know, how women rising to power um, had to shape shift as males in order to compete in a system that's so dominated by the masculine fight or flight uh, syndrome that there was literally no other option for success um, other than to adapt to the uh, ecology of relatedness that had been dominated by the patriarchal system. And, uh, and yet, I think around the world, uh, you think of, of uh, the woman who's the, the, the head of government in New Zealand, Just uh, in the in, yeah. uh, Iceland, uh, in Taiwan, um, even Merkel to a certain extent in Germany, welcoming in the refugees. So you're seeing, I think, in the world now, the beginnings of women in positions of real corporate and political power that are beginning to adapt to the ethos that you're describing in Cassandra Speaks. Yeah, it's gonna be rocky and complicated. And what I was talking about earlier, this, um, tendency we have to layer our political ideas over um, maybe our deepest spiritual ideas. I hate to make such a broad distinction. In, in the book, I make up a word called innervism. There's activism, then there's innervism. Innervism is using the tools of mindfulness, you know, rising into our balcony brain so that we can we can envision a world and then line up our behavior to match our vision so that we're you know the greatest leaders the people we trot out all the time the dr kings are people who tried so hard to bring you know the cross heaven onto earth in their being and it was, it's like a daily prayer. Let me walk my talk. So the great leaders, yes, have, you know, you know, you may think, yes, uh, the young women in American Congress now, like AOC, like, yeah, they're the best female leader now. They're showing it. Well, some other person who's a conservative, let's say Liz Cheney, who, to tell you the truth, I pulled Liz Cheney and AOC together. Like, thank you, women. Thank you for standing for truth, but doing with it as much dignity and kindness as you can. 
So I just want to make sure when we say women and transformation, we don't immediately think the left or the right. It's, that's not what it's about. It's about that part of the, the, fema the feminine that wants to include and tend everyone's heart and be emotionally intelligent and not um, override the, the heart for the head. You know, I, I, women have spent the last hundred years learning the masculine and we've done a hell of a job. We really have. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you say to little girls, you can be anything a boy can be. You can do anything a boy can do. I want parents now to say to their boys, you can do anything a girl can do. You see how your sister like loves to talk with her friends. You see how she cares for the other kids on the playground when they hurt themselves. You see how they're not afraid to cry. You see how they help mom around the house. You can do that too. That would make you an amazing human being. Boys can do anything girls can do. Girls can do anything boys can do. And then slowly, slowly, it won't matter anymore if you're a boy or a girl. We'll all just be doing our humanness and the roles will meld and merge. That's why all this stuff about identity right now and, and um, trans and things like that. To me, that's, it's weird and it's strange and uncomfortable, but it's good news. Like we are following some sort of spiritual calling to get out of the roles and just be our souls. Mm, beautifully put, get out of the roles and just be uh, our souls. I, I've never said that before and it rhymes too. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really think that's the bottom line. And, and uh, you can feel in, the, in all the gender fluidity going on um that 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 the the strictures between male and female masculine and feminine are literally breaking down um and i know having two sons uh millennial uh sons um and having you know lots of kids in the house and 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 so forth and so on you can see in this emerging generation i think exactly what you're saying i think that they're more soulful and less um, oriented to what what role they're kind of expected to play, because with global media and all the input coming in, there's we're in a, a universe now where everything has literally become everything, um, and there's all kinds of music, all kinds of food. You go into city oh, anywhere in the world, you can eat. I love it. I love cuisine. it. It's, it's chaotic, it's, but it's yeah. it's moving toward a yeah. higher organization. I I we're watching that, and every time I hear myself in my sixty plus years saying the internet is ruining, I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not. It can be bad and good, just like anything can. And the goodness of it is this um, connectivity. You know, Teilhard de Chardin, the great Christian mystic from which we took Omega Institute's name, he said, all, all of humanity and consciousness, even God is moving toward unity, toward oneness. We are moving toward oneness. And he, his interconnectivity stuff, a lot of people in tech have him as their guru, even though he was a Christian mystic and died in 1960 or something. Um, before the internet, I think he would say, yeah, this is an indication of what we yearn for, oneness. As we uh, close, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for the depth of your caring about humanity today. It's been very uh, moving to me. Uh, I, I think your, your notion of bringing uh, <clears throat> uh, Alexandria, Octavio Cortez, and Liz Cheney together <laughs> as both uh, emblematic of the caring feminine is so important for us all to hold. Uh, because what you're driving 
toward is not left or right, even male or female. There's a certain, I would say it's feminine, but it's also global. And, and that's another way to really look at it. What are the qualities that we humans need to embrace and embody that will allow us to knit ourselves together as one? And that in, by the nature of things is a more nurturing, caring, communicative, empathetic uh, disposition of being uh, because that's what is required for the interstices of diversity to come together in a creative impulse that's good for the whole. And so, I mean, given your book, everything you've done at Omega, what would be some practices or certain um, attitudes of being that you would suggest for us uh, 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 as we seek to embody this uh, uh, value and proposition in our daily lives? Well, I'll just very quickly teach one. It's one I've been relying on a lot recently. I, I came up with it. It's an ancient practice, but I called it something based on a um, needle point, a framed needle point I found in my sister's office when she died. My sister uh, was a nurse and she got lymphoma when she was pretty young and eventually she needed a bone marrow transplant and I tested as her match, her only match. And uh, before she, we had the bone marrow transplant, I actually wrote a book about it called Marrow. We tried to do that, take the other to lunch kind of thing with each other to go through our whole childhood and clear up our, anything that stood in the way of our cells getting along once my bone marrow went into her. Mm. And it, it lasted for a year and she had an incredible year and then she, the cancer came back. But when I was cleaning out her office, I came across this needle point and it said, do no harm, which is the Hippocratic oath that all medical professionals take, do no harm, but take no shit. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, the, the, the Buddhist statue that, um, you know, the iconography of the Buddha or Kuan Yin, you see this everywhere. Now it's in everybody's garden, these statues with one hand like this and one hand like this, one hand in this gesture of fearlessness, it's called. Uh, it's the no, the stop, boundary. You know what you were saying before to stand in what you know is true. Um, and then the other hand like this, which is the, in a cup, you're holding the suffering of the whole world everyone, no enemies, you're holding everyone, your heart is big enough to hold it all. So I call these the do no harm, the cup, where you do no harm, you walk through this world with total compassion for everyone and everything. Yeah, but you take no shit. You have boundaries, you have beliefs. So every day, if I don't have a lot of time to meditate, I'll just sit for a few minutes holding my hands like this and it's a prayer. Keep my heart so tender and open today and give me boundaries and help me stand in what I believe. But let me do it with kindness and faith and vastness. So you can feel it in your body if you just do this. Sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes you need only this. And sometimes you need only this. You go into a meeting and you're so angry and sure of yourself. You like, uh-oh. Like as Annie Lamott says, her prayer is, help me not be an asshole. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is the prayer of help me be open. Help me not think I'm the only one who knows what's going on here. But most of the time we need these together. Mm. And you feel it in your body. You feel your strength, your strong back your soft front, your cup holding all the pain of the world, your hand having boundaries. And you just pray, help me be this balanced human being and help me serve, help me serve the healing of the world. 
So that's, that's the practice I would leave you with. It's called the do no harm, but take no shit meditation. <laughs> I love this. I love <laughs> this. Elizabeth, you are a wonder. You are a wonder. And I think you've given us very sage advice. Thank you. you. Know, we need to be fearless in who we are and, and deeply empathetic in our embrace of all beings. That's yeah. the bottom line. And Not easy. Yeah. But worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Lesser, everyone, uh, author of a uh, number of books, but most recently, uh, Cassandra Speaks. Uh, and um, I recommend it very, very powerfully for all of us at this moment in history. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, then tomorrow. Much. Uh, everyone will turn to one of the aspects that Elizabeth is talking about. We're going to be returning to the domain of public health, and we're going to have a discussion of the fact uh, our theme for tomorrow convened by the Nordic uh, Health uh, 2030 movement and the uh, Europe Health Future uh, Forum. Uh, so that's tomorrow on Humanity Rising. But Elizabeth, uh, for today, thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm really sorry I can't be on the after chat. I have to scoot, but I so <laughs> enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to more with you. Yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you again here tomorrow. Same time, same station on Humanity Rising. Bye for now.